Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Martin Adam. I'm the acting director of the Religion, Culture and Society program here at the University of Victoria. Uh, I've been given the privilege uh, to uh, introduce and MC tonight's event, which I will tell you about momentarily. Uh, first of all, before getting to those uh, details, I would like to acknowledge the fact that, uh, with respect, we are standing on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen peoples uh, and the Songhees and Esquimalt, the Saanich nations as well, uh, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. So, um, with gratitude and respect, we will continue on, uh, and I will tell you a little bit about the background for today's lecture. It's part of a uh, of course, the Center for Studies and Religion Society uh, ongoing weekly series, but it is also a special lecture uh, put on through the Faculty of Humanities, a part of the Lansdowne lecture series, which every year we bring a distinguished speaker to, camp to campus. Uh, each academic unit, including religion, culture, and society are uh, given this opportunity. And so, uh, our choice this year is Karen Myers, uh, somebody who I will tell you a little bit about. I won't go on too long at her request and I'm in, because there's so much of interest that we wanna hear from her tonight. Uh, she's the academic director of the Amangalam Research Center in Berkeley, California, which is on the traditional ter territory of the Ohlone people. She teaches courses and organize progr organizes programs to make uh, the scholarly study of Buddhism available and accessible to Buddhist organizations, practitioners, and the general public, including an upcoming program uh, on Buddhism and the imagination. She became involved in the climate movement, organizing Buddhists for Extinction Rebellion in Boston, and currently co-facilitates East Bay Ecosattvas, a local and virtual group of Buddhist practitioners dedicated to decolonization and the indigenous land back movement. So you can see that Karen uh, comes with uh, some very interesting background and a long list of academic credentials, which I won't go into, but just on a personal note, I would like to say that I've long been uh, a fan of Karen's work. I always seem to be either one step behind or one step after uh, looking at what she's done in various areas, everything from Buddhism and free will to meditation theory and practice, and most recently Buddhism and ecology. So I think we are all going to learn a lot today. And with that, I will introduce Karen Meyer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the, the Lekwungen peoples, as well as to the persons who've helped with my visit, um, Scott Dolph, Rachel Brown, Nariko Prezo, um, Paul Bramadat at the Center for Studies of Religion and Society, as well as Melanie Letourneau in the Religion, Culture and Society program. And in particular, I would like to thank Martin Adam for extending the invitation. I'm honored to be here today to have an opportunity to talk about this subject, which feels so important at this time of climate and ecological crisis. Whether we are Buddhist, subscribe to some other faith, or do not identify with any particular religious tradition, many of us would agree that we are running out of time to get right with the more than human natural world, um, that something is terribly out of balance in the way that modern industrialized societies like we find in the US and Canada have organized themselves in relationship to earth systems and other than human beings with whom we share this earth, not to mention um, our relationship with other human beings, especially indigenous peoples, the original caretakers of these lands. Nearly every day brings news of some ecological climate or ecological emergency happening somewhere in the world. And some days this emergency finds us at home as this past summer with the heat wave deaths and fires in Western Canada. 
Many would argue that this is not merely a social, economic, political, or technological crisis, but a spiritual crisis, a crisis that demands a fundamental shift in our individual and collective ways of being and relating to the earth and also each other. It is also arguable that this shift, um, this is a shift which many historical religious traditions, including Buddhism, are not fully equipped to navigate, simply because there was not a climate or ecological crisis of this scale at the time of their founding. Compared to other world religions, however, Buddhism often gets a good rap as being ecologically sensitive. From an historical perspective, this is a bit curious because as we will see, when it began, Buddhism was rather ambivalent about the natural world. Thus, the perception that Buddhism is ecologically sensitive is the result of an evolution of Buddhist ideas. And today I'd like to trace some of these ideas from early Buddhist perspectives on the natural world through doctrinal shifts in later Indian and East Asian Buddhism, which have helped pave the way for the ecologically engaged forms of Buddhism that have been emerging today. In particular, I would like to focus on attention we find in early Buddhism and running throughout much of the later Buddhist tradition to some extent. And this is the tension between finding freedom from suffering in leaving the world, in turning away from it or transcending it, and finding freedom within the world, in loving the world in all its particularity and diversity. Hence the title of my talk, Love It or Leave It, Buddhist perspectives on the natural world. When asked about what he taught, the Buddha would say, I teach about suffering and the ending of suffering. Virtually all Buddhist traditions agree that this is the essence of Buddhism, but they have had rather different ideas about precisely how suffering arises and thus how it can end. In early Buddhism, Liberation from suffering is presented in terms of transcending the world, transcending conditioned embodied existence, transcending the cycle of rebirth or samsara in order to realize the unconditioned or nirvana. Some of you may be familiar with the doctrine of dependent origination or dependent arising. This doctrine is often interpreted today in explicitly ecological terms as offering insight into and celebrating the interconnected web of life. As the Vietnamese teacher Thich Nhat Hanh says, um, to be is to interbe. And that's just a little poster from Extinction Rebellion. Um, However, when Buddhism began, dependent origination meant something a bit different. It referred to the specific conditions that give rise to suffering in human beings. In other words, dependent origination wasn't something to be celebrated, but something to be overcome, to reverse, or to transcend. Some of you might also be familiar with this pictorial representation of dependent origination in the wheel of life, which is popular in Tibetan Buddhism. Here we have the three poisons or primary um, roots of suffering, greed, hatred, and delusion at the hub of the wheel. And then um, we have the five or six realms of rebirth and on the outer rim, the 12 links of dependent origination, which are the salient conditions that give rise to and perpetuate suffering. And all of this is held within the jaws of Yama, the Lord of Death. I won't go into detail regarding this picture or the 12 links, other than to say that this conception of suffering recommends sense rest restraint or even withdrawal from the senses, from contact with sensory objects in order to interrupt the pattern in which the feeling of pleasure 
or pain or indifference drives craving for more of the same or for a different experience. This then feeds into grasping onto phenomena as I and mine or me and belonging to me, um, which then leads to rebirth and the whole mass of suffering, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, and despair. And so early Buddhist discourses call this pattern of suffering the world, or they call the world this pattern of suffering. So in sum, early Buddhism, um, early Buddhism proposes the following dichotomies, the dichotomy between samsara and nirvana, conditioned versus unconditioned existence, embodied or in minded states versus a state beyond body and mind, um, dependent origination versus reversing the process of dependent origination or the world and what is beyond the world. And so all of this reinforces the basic idea that freedom from suffering is to be found in transcending the world. This orientation is also clear in early Buddhist cosmogonies or stories about the creation of the world. Because they hold that everything must have a cause, a set of conditions that come together to make the arising of something possible, Buddhists don't talk about absolute beginnings, but they do speak of relative beginnings, of the rebirth of persons after death and the recreation of the world after a cycle of destruction. One such story the, in the Aganya Sutta, or the Discourse on Beginnings, reveals a lot about Buddhist perspectives on the natural world. Uh, here, the Buddha describes how after the near total destruction of the world, in which only the quasi-physical planes of the heavens remain, a physical world re-emerges, heavenly beings of light, are born into the newly forming world and gradually become dependent on food. They become more solid and substantial and differentiated in their bodies. And as this happens, they learn to despise each other. At first, their food is abundant and just appears, but with the moral and spiritual decline of these proto-human beings, with their animosity and greed, their food also deteriorates. Eventually, food needs to be cultivated and stored, which gives rise to private property and conflict over resources. This, in turn, requires the establishment of a government of laws and punishment. In sum, the discourse describes a fall from a transcendent disembodied state to an embodied social existence full of suffering and strife. Those of you familiar with Buddhism might recognize that this story is a spiritual allegory for the Buddhist monastic path. This path involves ethical disciplines such as replacing animosity <laughs> and greed with kindness and generosity. It also involves removing oneself from general society, restraint of the senses, and the cultivation of transcendent states of consciousness, which are disembodied um, or only quasi-physical, and they are thought to be conducive to the realization of nirvana, which is again envisioned as a state beyond embodiment and rebirth. In addition to being an allegory for the monastic path of practice, this discourse on the beginnings of things also involves a critique of the Brahmanical caste system. Thus, it is natural, and I'm not gonna go into that today, um, but it's natural that it should center, given that context, it's natural that it should center human beings, yet its anthropocentrism, its centering of humans is still rather shocking. In describing the creation of the world, um, in describing the creation of the world, it does not mention 
any beings other than human beings. There are no animals and no plants other than the vegetal matter that serves as food for human beings. And at each stage of devolution, there is only one kind of food, a monoculture. If ecology is about the relation of organisms to each other in a diverse and complex environment, then this discourse is profoundly unecological. Arguably, the only ecological dimension of the text is the suggestion that the moral attitudes and behavior of human beings affect the quality of their environment. This point about the effect of human to human relations on the environment is made more clearly in a closely related discourse called the lion's roar of the world ruler. And this text describes a situation in which societal conditions have deteriorated due to poor political leadership. Poor rule has led to poverty and the unwise distribution of resources, which in my mind sounds a little familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the version of the text, sorry, the version of the text preserved in Chinese details the effect that this has on the environment at the lowest point of um, societal collapse. And so I'll just read a slightly abridged version of a passage from that text. At that time, one no longer hears in the world the names of ghee or honey or any sweet delicacies. Rice and seedlings turn into grass and weeds. Silk, brocade, cotton and white wool are not seen at all. Fabrics woven from coarse hair are the only kind of clothing. At that time, many thorny bushes grow on this earth and there are many mosquitoes and flies, fleas, snakes, vipers, wasps, centipedes, and poisonous worms. Gold, silver, lapis lazuli, pearls, and what are called gems completely disappear into the earth. On the surface of the earth, there appear only clay stones, sand, and gravel. There are many ravines and deep gorges with rushing rivers. The earth is a wasteland and people are scarce. People go about in fear. And at that time, fighting and plundering will manifest. Grass and sticks taken in hand will become weapons. For seven days, the people will turn to mutual harming. And that's the end of the quote. During these seven days, the, the discourse goes on to describe, a small group of people hiding out in the hills um, agree not to attack each other. And they gradually discover the benefits of and adopt other core Buddhist moral precepts based on the principle of non-harm. Eventually, society and the environment recover, which ushers in a new golden age in which the future Buddha Maitreya appears and another world um, ruling monarch also arises. Um, interestingly, when this monarch retires, he does not pass his wealth and kingdom onto his son as in the previous golden age, but instead gives it to the people. Political lessons aside, this discourse reinforces the idea that human moral attitudes and actions affect the physical conditions of the world, as well as the idea um, that human beings are at the center of the world rather than merely part of it. And so virtually all of the environmental conditions mentioned are those that pertain to human comfort and enjoyment. Precious materials like silk and gems are not available and deep gorges and rushing rivers that appear are difficult for human beings to navigate. We find a similar ethos in other early Buddhist descriptions of especially ideal urban environments, which seem to be ideal environments for lay people. In contrast to the austere, maybe monastic 
um, conditions described in the discourse on beginnings, these cities have abundant forms of life, but only those animals and plants that are useful or pleasing to human beings appear. For example, people enjoy well-planned parks and ponds with jeweled trees. There are songbirds and gentle rather than steep slopes down to the river and an absence of dangerous wild animals. Um, and the trees grow cooking pots and the like. Um, so given the anthropocentrism that we find in these early Buddhist texts, it's not surprising to find that um, early Buddhist schemes of rebirth also center human beings. Um, and so although there are various realms of existence, these are conceived primarily as pre and post human destinies. There are births as human like beings in hell and in ghostly realms, as well as in God in the demigod realms, vegetable and elemental life, which is respected by other Indic traditions is excluded. There are non-human animals, but their realm is, is also conceived primarily as an unfortunate and unfortunate um, post or pre-human um, destiny. Animals are depicted as stupid, violent, and lustful, and is in, as incapable of making spiritual progress. And so they are basically, animals are basically more carnal, lesser humans, rather than forms of life with their own distinct characteristics and intelligences. So far, we've seen that early Buddhist attitudes towards the natural world include identification of sensory or embodied existence as a problem, as well as a profound centering of human beings and interest over the greater ecosystem and other than human beings. However, we've all seen pictures of the Buddha under a tree. According to tradition, the Buddha was born under a tree, awakened under a tree, taught under a tree, and died under a tree, although different trees. <laughs> um, in early Buddhist art, the Buddha is even represented as a tree, the picture on the left there. Furthermore, stock phrases describing the path of meditation begin with the instruction, take yourself to the foot of a tree. Um, and set up mindfulness. In, in the Indian subcontinent, the shade of a tree has some practical or instrumental value for sure, but surely all of this association with trees also must speak to a special connection with trees, if not to the rest of the natural world. Surely, Profound stillness and quietude under a tree would have evoked in the Buddha and to his companions a sense of the aliveness and intelligence of the more than human world, just as it does for many modern persons. If the Buddha, however, if the Buddha did experience such nature connection, if it was part of his teaching on dependent origination, then the texts are silent on the matter. However, the texts do speak to the benefits of practice in nature. So the Buddha suggests that the ideal place for a monastery is a forest grove, although one that is not so far away from town that the monks can't walk to town to get provisions, to, to get offerings um, from lay people, receive material support, and they can also share the Dharma with people in town. However, early Buddhist texts also speak to the benefits of practicing in the wilderness. They suggest that the wildness, weirdness, and hardships of nature, the dangers of nature, help promote non-attachment. And less often, they suggest that the beauty and harmony of nature might support the serenity and, and um, stillness required for meditation. This suggests um, 
these descriptions of practice in nature certainly suggest a greater intimacy with the more than human natural world than the discourse on beginnings or in those descriptions of urban paradises. However, these texts are still oriented towards transcending the world. Here too, removal from society is preparation for withdrawal from sensory experience and eventually um, from embodied existence, from, from the cycle of rebirth. The nature and health or intrinsic value of the more than human world seems to be rather a rather secondary concern, if one at all. Yet the more than human world does play an important role in early Buddhist practice. The first ethical precept is not to kill or injure any living beings. This suggests that animals and maybe even plants are worthy of our moral consideration, even if they are not moral agents themselves, and if they are of lesser value than human beings, as is suggested by early Buddhist cosmology and ethics. Um, the value of the more than human world is reinforced by Buddhist heart practices, which include the divine attitudes of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And these attitudes include all living beings. While later classical instructions for practice tend to focus on cultivating these attitudes in relationship to different categories of human beings, um, the, the preferred method in early discourses is to radi radiate the attitude um, with all categories of beings in mind. So deliberately inclusive, these texts specify beings of different strengths and sizes, those that are seen and unseen, near and far, born and yet to be born. Some texts also specify that various classes of deities, um, some, some texts also include various classes of deities or include both stationary and mobile beings, that is plants as well as animals. In the early discourses, the divine attitudes, again, are cultivating by radiating these attitudes towards all categories of beings in each of the cardinal directions until one experiences the attitude without any obstruction or boundary and without any preference or distinction between beings. Hence, these qualities are also described as immeasurable or boundless. Although the focus is on the transformative effect on, um, on human beings when they cultivate these qualities, the notion that all beings are equally worthy of love seems to counteract the anthropocentrism we find in other early Buddhist texts, and also perhaps the um, impulse to transcend the world. Given that early Buddhists saw rebirth and especially animal rebirth as unfortunate, it is not surprising to find animals as proper objects of compassion. But what about sympathetic joy, the delight one feels in response to the gifts um, and good fortune enjoyed by others? The fact that this is to be cultivated in relationship to all kinds of beings um, so it seems to suggest a celebration of life. Moreover, attending to the diversity of beings and rejoicing in their gifts and good fortune as if they were our own requires, would seem to require an opening rather than a closing of the senses and finding something of value in conditioned and embodied existence in other beings and in ourselves. Although they have fallen somewhat out of favor today, the divine attitudes were at one point considered central to the Buddhist path. Early Buddhist texts describe the divine attitudes as resulting in freedom of the heart. 
meaning liberation from afflictive emotional states. This freedom is presented as complementary to, and even as a prerequisite for liberation by wisdom. That is the liberation that comes from insight into the instability, dissatisfactoriness, and selflessness of phenomena. This suggests that liberation involves loving the world, even as it requires letting go of attachment to and identification with it. While the divine attitudes, again, seem to reflect um, or recommend a different orientation towards the world, early Buddhism is still oriented towards a transcendent rather than imminent spirituality or um, conception of freedom. While this orientation persists um, to some extent in later Buddhism, there are some seismic shifts with the advent of the Mahayana or greater vehicle Buddhism, which decenter this conception of the path. Beginning around the first century um, BC or first century of the common era, there are some reconceptions of the relationship between samsara and nirvana, um, dependent origination and awakening, which have critical implications for Buddhist perspectives on the natural world in East Asia and in the West today. And I will want to discuss three of these briefly before making some final comments about ecologically engaged practice today. So while early Buddhism conceives of, of nirvana and samsara as opposed as a transcendent unconditioned state versus a conditioned state of suffering that is the world, this re relationship is reconceived in the Mahayana such that samsara and nirvana are the same reality seen from different perspectives, from a perspective of attachment and ignorance and hence suffering and from a perspective of freedom. So this reconception of samsara and nirvana, or what we might call the non-duality of samsara and nirvana, creates a subtle shift in the locus of suffering and thus the means to liberation from it. The path no longer requires cutting off contact with sensory experience, but focuses instead on disrupting craving by leaning on insight into this insubstantial nature of phenomena, the fact of their impermanence um, or the fact of the impermanence and essencelessness or emptiness of phenomena. According to this view, phenomena are not unreal, but they don't have the kind of solidity and stability that we habitually attribute to them. Part of the insubstantiality of phenomena emphasized in the Mahayana is the fact that they don't exist independently, but only in relationship to other phenomena. We find this idea in early Buddhism in regard to persons, um, persons are not permanent and do not exist independently. Our body and minds and all that we identify with as self or belonging to self are subject to causes and conditions that are beyond our control. However, in the Mahayana, this insight is extended to all phenomena. And with this, the concept of dependent origination shifts from referring primarily to the specific conditions that give rise to suffering in human beings to describing the nature of all conditioned phenomena as depending on causes and conditions and as being empty of their own intrinsic natures or essences. Arguably, this doc, and there's much more to be said about that doctrine, but hopefully that sketch will serve our purposes today. But arguably, this doctrine comes to its fullest and most poetic expression in the Chinese school of Huayan Buddhism's concept of interpenetration or relational holism. <clears throat> 
This is the idea that all phenomena are not only dependent on each other, but are contained within or interpenetrate each other. The basic idea is that the whole is within the part and the part in the whole. And this is often illustrated by the image of Indra's jeweled net. This is a vast net that extends over the entire cosmos. And at each node in this net is a jewel. And each jewel reflects all the other jewels in the totality of the net. Each jewel is unique and is what it is only by virtue of its relationship to all of the other jewels and the whole. Um, this vision of um, phenomena has been described as a kind of relational holism in which the unity of all phenomena coincides with their distinctiveness and diversity. Although it was not, this doctrine was not traditionally interpreted in ecological terms, relational holism has been very productive for contemporary Buddhist ecological thinking. Relational holism can also be understood as an expression of the insight that undergir undergirds the early Buddhist heart practices in which the unique characteristics and circumstances of all kinds of beings serves as the focus of an infinite and undivided attitude of love, compassion, joy, or equanimity. And so that, I'm, I haven't, I, that is not um, part of official doctrine. It's just a connection that I'm making that, that the logic of love in early Buddhism seems to be reflected in this later concept of relational holism. Um, the third innovation in Indian Mahayana thinking that I'd like to introduce is the concept of Buddha nature. This is the idea that we all have an awakened Buddha nature within us. For most of us, it is hidden, temporarily obscured by ignorance and emotional defilements. And from this perspective, the process of awakening and liberation from suffering involves clearing away what is, is obscuring our true nature. Thus, there is no need to transcend the world in order to do this. And this has profound implications for Buddhist practice. The idea of our own awakened nature as imminent in our being complements the idea that nirvana and samsara are not separate realities, but rather the same reality under different perspectives. In other words, the doctrine of Buddha nature reinforces the idea of awakening within the world rather than by transcending it. While the Indian Buddhist doctrine of Buddha nature um, focuses on sentient beings and especially human beings, East Asian Buddhists extend Buddha nature to all phenomena, especially the natural world. According to this doctrine, um, to some versions of this doctrine, all phenomena express Buddha nature, but they do so in their own distinctive ways. In doing so, they teach the Dharma. And although they do not speak in human languages, their teachings can help human beings discover our own Buddha nature. In some versions of the doctrine, so-called and sentient beings like rocks and trees and grasses are, are considered more awake than us, or they do not even need to awaken because unlike us human beings, they express their Buddha nature without the interference of a deluded and dividing mind. The idea that all phenomena express Buddha nature radically inverts the hierarchy and anthropocentrism of Indian Buddhism. <clears throat> 
It also recommends a way of practice that involves attentiveness to the more than human world in all of its distinctiveness. And like the Huayan doctor, doctrine of relational holism and the early Buddhist divine attitudes, it suggests that this distinctiveness can coincide with the fact of unity or oneness. I would like to conclude today with some thoughts about the implication of these different perspectives for an ecologically engaged Buddhism. As previously mentioned, some of the later developments, some of these later developments in Buddhist doctrine, like the idea of dependent origination as an interconnected web of life, have become commonplace in contemporary Buddhist ecological thinking. Um, and in contemporary ecological thinking more generally. Buddhists, as well as non-Buddhists, cite the doctrine of dependent origination as evidence of Buddhism's ecological credentials or um, ecologies, Buddhist or spiritual credentials. And there's much to say about that, but I'd like to focus on the Buddhist heart practices, the divine attitudes of loving kindness and so on in relation to knowledge and freedom. The contemporary philosopher, Hannah de Jaeger, argues for seeing loving as a basis for knowledge. I can't do justice to her arguments or theory here, but the basic is idea is that in modern Western context, we tend to understand knowing as a mind in relationship to an object. We know objects when they conform to our ideas and expectations. And this kind of knowing lends itself to a sense of separation or even um, and even violence and domination because it turns people, animals, plants and land into objects, into objects that can be contained in our minds within our concepts or categories and ideas. Um, they become objects that can be owned or suit our own ends. Loving is an entirely different proposition when it comes to knowledge. Loving is about relationship. It is about intimacy and curiosity without expectation, um, without the expectation of fully understanding the other, without the need to contain the other within a concept or use the other for some end of our own. Deep loving, respects the distinctiveness and autonomy of the other, and it, and it involves a willingness to be transformed by the other rather than imposing our will or desire upon the other. There's not time to fully spell it out here, but this resonates in my mind with the ethos of Huayan relational holism and the concept of phenomena as unique expressions of Buddha nature. The concept of all phenomena and all beings as unique expressions of Buddha nature. To know in the context of these frameworks is to resist the urge of the rational conceptual mind to erase difference, to resist the urge to make phenomena conform to our own ideas or ends. I also think this resonates with the early Buddhist idea of love as a kind of liberation. Why should love be liberating? And specifically, why should a kind of love that views all forms of life as equally worthy, but respects their particularity and diversity be liberating? The real answer probably cannot be put into words. However, I think we can imagine how such love might offer liberation from self-concern from the concepts about self and other that separate us from each other and from the world and which feed our grasping at I and mine, what is me and belonging to me. Thus, while early Buddhism conceives of freedom as leaving the world, 
its doctrine of love combined with the insights into relational holism and Buddha nature help chart an imminent path of liberation, which encourages attentiveness to the diversity of life and which decenters human beings without devaluing them. And I think this last point is important because looking at what humans or at least certain humans are doing to the earth, many Buddhists and non-Buddhists conclude that perhaps we shouldn't exist. Perhaps we deserve to suffer for what we've done. Perhaps the earth would be better off without us. Perhaps we should give up trying to save ourselves. These feelings are understandable, but the Buddhist doctrine of love refuses this conclusion. It suggests that we are all worthy of love, just not more love than the more than human beings with which we share this wondrous earth. Yeah. All right, I think I'm on. Uh, that was wonderful, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for a, a tour de force through uh, centuries of Buddhism and uh, wonderful uh, doctrinal developments. I would like to invite questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, some time left. Uh, we also have our Zoom uh, uh, audience as well. I'm not sure uh, of the technological side of that. Yeah. And I'm sorry to Zoom people. I yeah. had trouble. There's no one sitting behind you, so it's hard to <laughs> look over here. Yeah. So there are some questions in the audience, and maybe we can see okay. if, if the Zoom people are. Can you see the Zoom? I can't people? see the Zoom people. So you can't? No. Oh, wait, maybe. I think maybe I can change this though. Okay. Would it be okay. okay to put them on here? Okay, while, while the technical thing is going on, maybe there was a question. I saw some hands up. Yes. Yes. I wanted to thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Very much, not only a non but I'm sure. I'm asking, I think, a historian question, but one that's really inspired by thinking, uh, thinking of things in a, in a different direction. So I was thinking, could you see me in some ways, and I love the way you do, like all kinds of different doctrinal uh, points and so simply, and that is not just the idea of the relationship. Well, so I was thinking, could you see some of the history of self does the, the selfishness have a history? And the historian wants to know how it's constructed in different places. So, is that something that you would like to engage with? Yeah, and it's such an interesting question because, of course, Buddhism is all about non attachment to self. And I did talk about it a lot today, but, but it's a very central part of Buddhism. And yet, and it can be shocking, right? A little shocking to find these texts where it's just the human, and while at the same time, there is this kind of, you know, thought that it's important to love all the beings. And, but that's one of the few places in the early discourses anywhere where you see the whole sort of context of the more than human world really centered. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting way to propose it. Um, and maybe it's impossible to separate them, or is this complication so big it can't even be defined? You know? Well, is that so? Even if there's a not attachment to individual self, isn't the kind of identification and focus on human beings? sort of implicitly some kind of attachment to identity. And also to that grasping, so big thing, it just was slightly mentioned today, but this grasping at me and mine, this is a huge theme in Buddhism. And when we find these descriptions of kind of these paradises, it's all about the things that are pleasing to human beings and not necessarily good for 
the rest of the more than human world. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Summarize the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, for for people on Zoom and um, anyone watching the recording, the question was, you know, could we look at this as a kind of history of selfishness? Um, and and that the historian who asked this is curious about this within other um, human contexts and cultures. Good. Why don't we see if the do you want to? Can you scan the Zoom and just? I can. Take, I can see if, if somebody any... wants to raise their hand. I think I can even. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. You look for her hand. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so there was some hands down yeah, here too. Yes. Sorry. So. Or sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean that it's a little that was sort of a gross generalization. You still find them mentioned all the time in, in the context of Buddhist practice, but they, they don't tend to be um central practices today. That they're sort of add um, additional practices or they form the context of some ritual or meditative practice rather than being um, a kind of path unto itself and it seems in early discourse maybe they were at one point regarded as a path yeah yes i'm curious to know how this relates since i'm not a specialist at all a Western idea of the great chain of being, where you present the scale of beings all the way up to God. And I, I'm not clear, uh, again, not knowing very much about it, how we see the interconnectedness of nature in, in this framework, because it's not clear to me you can love all things equally, but how are they related within themselves? And do we understand that so differently from that? I just don't. I just don't know how the chain of being might look if it's just always connected. Do you want to paraphrase that for the Zoom? Oh, wait. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, how does this relate to the great chain of being, and um, and how, for example, also do do we think uh, or, or do Buddhists think of the sort of individual beings within this um, great chain of being? And I think like the great, you know, idea of great chain of being, there's a hierarchy here. There's clearly a hierarchy. I think this, I was trying to suggest this gets decentered a bit in, especially in the East Asian context, but it begins when we begin to look at each kind of being as having its own distinct Buddha nature and expression, then that creates the possibility of not, um, of, 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 Decenter, you know, of, of decentering us and also challenging that hierarchy. And also another thing I didn't emphasize too much, I had to cut it out, but when Buddhists do talk about animals, I, I, it was a little bit in there, but they tend to really even plant, you know, project <laughs> human characteristics on them. And in my other lecture that I did for Martin's class, I talked a little bit about um, or, or I guess maybe I didn't, but <laughs> ways in which, um, you know, it doesn't really, other, other traditions did a better job sometimes of um, really observing the natural world and how it's actually working than Buddhist. It's been suggested that Buddhists try to um, rationalize uh, the world um, and, you know, make it fit into this scheme and make it fit with the karma and rebirth and kind of forget about these other forms of life. Andrew. Thank you, because that actually relates to, to something that I was wondering. Um, is there any kind of distinction in your mind in this schema between beings that are presumably conscious and those that are not conscious? And I almost found myself, and here I'm assuredly projecting, but Conscious and non-conscious beings 
part of what's going on. Yeah. So the question was about um, uh, human consciousness and maybe beings that don't have human consciousness and whether maybe the problem is human consciousness. And um, this is actually very much one of the thoughts. I, I maybe referenced it really briefly in passing, but this becomes, so in the Indian context, Buddha nature belongs to sentient beings. But in, in China, there wasn't this distinction, this categorical distinction between sentient and insentient beings. And before, before Buddhism arrived, and there also was the idea of things like the Tao, you know, the same principle pervading everything, um, you know, in different ways, each according to its own way. But, but that, and so that sets them up for this question and they wrestle over this, you know, what about insentient, what about the Buddha nature of insentient beings? And then in that discussion, one of the questions that arises is maybe actually these insentient beings are really truly expressing Buddha nature because it is our minds that are creating the delusions that um, prevent us from realizing our, our Buddha nature or fully embodying it. Um, one critique that comes up here is you know, so do we just go unconscious? There's a huge debates in both China and Tibet about this. Like, is it better to just drop all, <laughs> all concepts? Is that gonna, you know, may help us awaken? Um, so there's some controversy about that. Yeah. yeah. There's a question on Zoom. Okay. Okay. John. And should I, okay, you can unmute. Hi. Um, I I'll get to talk to you more, but just a quick question for now. You mentioned um, really in passing the name of a philosopher who was a linchpin for your turn to love itself as a form of knowledge. Um, and uh, it sounded like you wanted to say more. I'd just like to catch the name again because I didn't quite catch it. And then I would welcome you to say anything you want to say about that. <laughs> It's, it's Hannah de Jaeger. And um, I gave my thumbnails by such in, um, in the talk. Um, yeah, I, I feel off the top of my head, I'm not sure if I could say too much else about it right now. But she's looking, she talks a little bit about um, an active theory and is kind of, and, and finds that very kind of as, as a launching point for then talking about this, um, she doesn't call it epistemology of the heart, but I almost want to call that, but this, this, she does say epistemology of love. And so if you email me, I'm happy to share this article. It was really rich and detailed, but it's just kind of escaping my ability to summarize at the moment. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so you should be able to see the question there. The chat. Right. Ask me. Okay. It says, can you speak to early and later Buddhist ideas of hierarchies of beings or animals who are higher or closer to, to humans for rebirth purposes, for example, and who are lower? Um, yeah, so the problem, so in the Buddhist cosmology, uh, the human birth is the ideal birth. And the human birth is the ideal birth in, in part because we're conceived to have more moral agency. And so we can act in ways, we have more, um, <laughs> we could say, um, cosmological mobility. We, we have, because we, we ha are a moral agent, we can act with intention, we can, we can act with intention for the good or ill. It's thought that, that we can um, um, really, you know, do actions that will get us, you know, born in lower states or in higher states. Whereas um, animals, because they don't have minds. So this is a different perspective on mind because they don't have minds. They can't even like, you know, 
there's some context where animals can like benefit from Buddhist discourse, but for the most part, they don't think and they can't, they can't, they don't really have a lot of choices. And so they don't um, accumulate karma. They don't, they just burn off <laughs> their karma. And so, and that's generally kind of the, the same, same principle more or less applies to the um, other realms, but for other reasons. So in the hell realms, beings are just being tortured all the time. They don't have any, any capacity to uh, practice the path. They're just trying to you know, withstand this, this, exi this existence until that karma runs out. And same um, with the, the, well, the gods is less slightly like, different. The gods really enjoy, <laughs> they forget to practice. <laughs> Although some of the god realms, you know, some of the states, high states of meditation are equated to the god realms. Um, but in general, um, especially in the just, the sort of lower gods, they just really enjoy their lives and then suddenly their lives are over. They, their garlands will, their friends back away from them as they start to smell and they grow old and die and they're very shocked by this. So, um, but in terms of different kinds of animals, um, I don't really, I can't really think of, I'd have to do a little research to see examples where there's a, you know, real, just maybe somebody else in, in the Zoom room or, or physical room knows um, more detail on this, but, you know, just where Buddhists have specifically taught, I would imagine that there's some place where different kinds of animals are um, thought to have greater capacities than others, but still very limited compared to human beings. We have time for, Paul had one question and, and that'll be, have to keep it really short and the answer brief as well. And then we have an announcement yeah. afterwards. So. Perfect, this is the perfect end of lecture question. Super, super easy, you can answer in five sentences like that. No, I'm teasing actually. Um, <laughs> I think we have an additional question about this, this uh, history. Um, I wonder if you could summarize what the shift in the theme of karma occur to myself, there must be some sort of conditions that are related to the impact that are related to the Yeah. <laughs> so we're out of time. <laughs> so the question was was the very easy question that um you know where do where did these shifts come from? What are what are the conditions that that generate um, these shifts. Um, and I, so I tend, because my discipline is primarily philosophy and not history or um, society um, or sociology, I, I, there's probably a lot going on in, in the larger um, context, but in terms of history of ideas, you have, um, yeah, specific specific conditions. I think a lot of the Mahayana is trying to get back to some early insights, but in in doing so, they create these shifts. Um, and so, in terms of um, dependent origination, there's a whole story about the way Buddha Buddhists start to reify they say there's no self, but they start to reify phenomena. And so the doctrine of dependent origination and it's linking with emptiness, you know, in, or the later doctrine of dependent is really um, pushing against this, you know, kind of divergence from the Buddha wasn't saying that phenomena are real and persons aren't. <laughs> but, so so I, I see those kinds of shifts and I'd have to think and probably other people could speak better to the, the social and historical condition, but it's, it's a very good and worthy question. All right, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to pick up on some of these. Uh, we can think it through tomorrow's together. Tomorrow's <laughs> coffee talk for the center uh, members who are there. And I want to thank Karen for a remarkable lecture and, uh, and uh, all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, we have a final announcement that Scott is just working on for a special lecture next week, you can see, uh, pertaining to very topical uh, 
uh, area. So uh, please, uh, pardon me. And I will. Yes. Okay, so there's a, there is this one is next Wednesday, and then there's another one on Thursday, uh, which you can check the CSRS website for the details for. And so please come out for both. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>